Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to start by saying, uh, just so you know from the beginning, that this presentation is being recorded. Uh, welcome to the second evening at the Homestead. I wish we could indeed be at the Homestead, but this is um, a fine surrogate for now. Uh, I'm Ryan Orgera, and I'm the SCCF uh, CEO, and we are entering our 54th year of conservation on our islands, and our programs range from marine research to water quality advocacy to our native plant nursery and our sea turtle and shorebird research and to our Sanibel Sea School. And we own and operate over uh, 1,875 acres. And of course, we're fully dedicated to public education like evenings at the homestead. So I wanna say a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, I want you to understand that presenters cannot see the audience or hear the audience. So treat it as though you are watching TV. Um, since this presentation is in a webinar format, there's not that level of interactiveness. And our speaker will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. And this can be done by selecting at the bottom of your screen, you should see Q and A, question and answer feature. Please open that to ask a question. And at the end of the presentation, we will be able to answer your questions uh, in the order they arrive. So tonight you're in for a treat. It's a subject that is near and dear to my heart, elasmobranchs or sharks, rays, chimeras, and certainly the small tooth sawfish that we're gonna learn about this evening. I wonder how many of you realize how near you live to one of the rarest fish on the planet. In fact, some scientists classify sawfish as the most endangered group of marine fishes. And they're certainly the most endangered group of shark ray and cousins, we'll say. Sawfish are protected from legal international trade by CITES, the Convention in the Trade of, international, uh, in the trade of Endangered Species, because they're listed on Appendix 1, which does not allow any international trade because it is not sustainable. And they are, of course, protected in the United States and in turn, the state of Florida. There's evidence that sawfish have existed in more than 90 countries. And today, realistically, conservationists believe that we're, we could save them in only about four nations. Florida remains one of those last strongholds for global uh, sawfish. Florida and Australia account for the bulk of the world's population of sawfish, known population of sawfish. Florida only has one since it has been since the 1960s that we haven't seen the lar large tooth sawfish. But Australia has four such species. Sawfish are so susceptible uh, to global pressures because they become entangled in fishing gear and because their fins are highly prized in Asian markets. Additionally, their rostrum or their nose, right, with all the teeth that you're familiar with, are prized both in decorative markets, but also in the, I'll just say, vile uh, activity that is cockfighting, where they are used for spurs tied to roosters' legs. Sharks and rays in general are facing unbearable global pressures. Between 63 and 273 million sharks are killed annually, most of those for their fins. So we're incredibly lucky in Florida to be the keepers of such fragile species in need of our help locally and certainly globally. And tonight, our talk is entitled, Where Have We Been and Where Are We Going? The Plight of the Endangered Small Tooth Sawfish and What's Being Done to Promote Recovery in the United States. Dr. Greg Polakis has been a fish biologist in the state of Florida since 1997. For his entire career, he has been based out of the Charlotte Harbor Field Laboratory in Port Charlotte and has been dedicated to learning about fishes of Charlotte Harbor estuarine systems. His work has ranged from documenting the fish species found within the harbor to multi-species assessment of habitat use to single species research on habitat use, seasonality, and reproduction. These days, he spends most of his time running the state's sawfish research program. We are lucky to have one of the the world's foremost experts on Florida sawfish. So I'll turn it over to you, Greg. Thanks so much. All right, thanks, Ryan. Uh, I appreciate the, that uh, introduction. It's nice to uh, be able to uh, you know, speak with everybody and, and uh, update everybody on what we've been up to <clears throat> with, uh, with this species. Uh, we started doing our research shortly after they that list is in danger. That, um, as Ryan mentioned, they've been protected in Florida for uh, since 1992, and that's uh, helped helped kind of set the stage so that when they were 
um, listed at, uh, federally as endangered, um, we were able to uh, kind of hit the ground running as far as the, the research goes. So, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm the one doing the, the, the presentation uh, tonight, but um, I've listed a, a bunch of um, co-authors here, you know, with uh, this is certainly not the, um, the complete list of uh, the folks that have helped with this particular research. Um, I'll, I'll put more of a, a complete list uh, up at the, in the acknowledgements at the end. Um, but uh, but it, I'm, you know this is a collaborative uh, research project um, for sure, and uh, you know I'm I'm just uh, you know kind of summarizing it and um, you know just play a role and it. it's uh, it takes a a lot of people to get this uh, this work done and to uh, learn about this species because we really didn't know much about them um, at all, which uh, I'll kind of get into here uh, in, momentarily. So. Um, so tonight, I, I don't have time to talk about every single thing that, that we've been doing with the species, um, but I will um, do my best to, to hit the high points on a few things. I'll start by just going into an introduction, elaborating on a little bit of uh, what, what Ryan al already started to um, talk about in terms of, uh, of uh, the kind of the plight of, of the whole family, uh, which is has five species in we're lucky to have one of them in our in our backyard, so to speak. So I'll go into a little bit of that, you know, kind of uh, focus it on, on Florida, uh, talk about some of the methods, some of the uh, techniques we use to do the research, um, and then get into where where and when we catch the sawfish, you know, locally. Uh, talk a little bit about the movement, some of the acoustic work that we do. That's something that the, the technology is really kind of taken off and. And we're trying to use that um, to our benefit uh, with with this species. Uh, everybody wants to know what they eat, so uh, I want to you know try to touch on that a little bit um, as well. And then kind of where where are we going, uh, you know, in the in the near future, uh, kind of thing. So um, you know these these things are are just just a crazy just a crazy species. I mean, if if I hadn't seen one myself, I mean, it, it looks like a cartoon, right? I mean. You know this this fish this you know looks like a shark with a with a hedge trimmer for a nose and it just you know it just doesn't look real um but it's it's really an amazing you know feat of evolution uh to to just have this this crazy species in our backyard um and and it's just crazy shape you know this just crazy species so um you know where you know how this you know that that long you know where the name comes from, where that rostrum that that we call it, um, the saw comes from. Um, you know there aren't a lot of fossils uh, because the you know most of you probably know that the the skeleton of sharks and rays is made out of cartilage, but doesn't fossilize as well as as bone does. Um, there are some fossils, and you know geologists have kind of uh, come up with some hypotheses um, to. Uh, you know, explain how we kind of got to this point. You know, the ancestor was about 200 million years ago, and and um, you know this toothed rostrum that it has. They're actually modified scales. You know, those teeth that are on the rostrum, but um, it's allowed the species to uh, expand the sensory capabilities. Uh, sharks and rays are are famous for their sensory biology. They have that electro sense, which uh, you know a lot of people associate and think about with uh, sharks and rays. Um, but that long uh, rostrum really allows them to, um, you know, really hone in on um, prey that are in the, in the either in the, um, the at the bottom or up in the water column, depending on you know what what they're trying to do. So, um, so a really neat adaptation, you know, real success story in terms of evolution. Um, unfortunately, that success story, um, you know, it, it landed it in some trouble. Um, because uh, I've kind of highlighted this um, in yellow here, this, you know, gillnet bycatch, um, you know, this is, a, you know, try and think of a species that gets caught easier in a net than a fish with a hedge trimmer for, for a nose, you know, so it's, they're very easily caught in nets. <clears throat> um, to our, uh, you know, to our knowledge, there was never any um, specific fisheries where people were targeting them, but, you know, if you're trying to make a living, uh, you know, 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, um, you know, by by netting uh, fish, the last thing you want to do is is have a, a, a one or two or 10 sawfish um, in, in your net that you're trying to make a living with, right? 
So, um, so it was a, a nuisance fish, which um, obviously created a, a problem uh, in terms of the gill nets, but and really any kind of net, you know, trawls, um, but all these other things that are listed here kind of contributed in, in uh, one way or another uh, to the decline and, and kind of is why, 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 why we're at where, why we're at uh, this endangered situation uh, currently. So um, in a nutshell, um, the, the, life, the lifestyle of the sawfish is, is, is a big part of why there, there aren't many out there either. So uh, fish like, um, you know, snook and tarpon and red drum that we have in our local waters, um, they're, you know, kind of on this good uh, side, the left-hand side of the, the slide here where they, you know, they make lots, of, uh, lots and lots of eggs, you know, millions of eggs at a time. Um, which produce millions of larvae. Um, they mature relatively fast, um, so they're able to withstand some uh, fisheries, and, you know, some uh, you know harvest from a human perspective, and also um, you know they can deal with disturbances like cold kills and red tide and things like that. Um, on this bad side, uh, so to speak, is where the sawfish are. You know, all the sharks and rays really. Um, fall into this category where um, they take longer to mature. Uh, they don't make millions of babies. They only make a handful if they're lucky. Um, they're bigger and they're they're going to survive, um, but they just they just take longer if the population um, gets uh, gets depleted. So that's that's uh, from a biology standpoint. That's just a general overview of of um, kind of the the reason why they're. Um, uh, they're uh, slow to recover, and and uh, although they are starting to show some signs of recovery, uh, it's uh, it's going to take a while because of the just the way their biology is. So <clears throat> you've probably seen some of these old time pictures. Um, this one's from a little a little further south there, Marco Island. Um, I call this the smoking man picture. This is. Uh, um, you know, a commercial fishery, uh, I assume, uh, where, you know, fisheries, you know, the, when they did get uh, sawfish, sometimes they would keep them uh, for bait or, you know, meat, you know, that kind of thing. But like, like I said before, they really weren't targeted that we know of uh, very often. Um, recreational fisheries uh, played a role. I mean, imagine coming down from, you know, Michigan or something, you don't even know there's a, a fish like this. And, you know, if you catch it, um, it's going to be a, a, a great story to tell, right? So, you know, commercial fisheries, or uh, sorry, recreational fisheries played a, a role in, um, in the decline as well. A um, couple of other uh, pictures here. This the one on the right here is from the Peace River uh, from back in the 30s. Um, this, this is likely to be a, a, a female, probably a pregnant female that, that swam up into the river um, to give birth and, you know, got caught. This picture on the left is from Melbourne over on the East Coast uh, in the early uh, 1900s. And if you notice, if you look really close, you can see that the, all the babies, all the embryos um, that were inside mom are, are tied up with her on the tree here. And, you know, as, you know, unfortunate, you know, it is that this, this picture, you know, the situation happened. This is actually one of the very few um, records we have of how many young sawfish can have. So some of these, sometimes these historical pictures can be really useful uh, in trying to learn about the species. So um, just, uh, I wanted to include this real briefly, just uh, as a listing history, you know, Ryan mentioned this in the beginning a little bit. Um, we've got uh, the early nineties, uh, they're protected in Florida and then eventually on the Endangered Species Act and then other, other protections followed. Um, at that time, we really, we didn't even know how many species there were for sure. So there's been some genetic work. Um, so we can say there are five species of sawfish um, confidently now, and that we have one, the small two sawfish in Florida. Um, and um, and we're, 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 we're happy to have it and, and lucky that it's still, still around. Um, these maps here, you can see the, these are data from um, encounter reports. So from um, People from the public, you know, when they catch or they see a sawfish and they call in, um, we, uh, uh, as a recovery team, you know, um, uh, summarized all those data. And you can see that um, years and years ago, they used to go up the, sea, the uh, eastern seaboard up into um, you know, the Carolinas for sure, even a little further than that, maybe in the summertime, 
all the way out throughout the Gulf uh, in the U.S. But Florida was always important for sawfish. You know, it was always kind of the central, um, uh, kind of the core range. So, um, so we're we're uh, and that's still the case now. Uh, and and that's kind of what this other map was meant to show is that we're we're pretty much, you know, uh, Florida is the only game in town. And it's pretty much from Charlotte Harbor, where we are, down to the Keys, just that section of Florida. I mean, we hear about them on the East Coast uh, from time to time, and I'll touch on a, a recent record that, that we're excited about. We uh, were able to get a tag out on one over there. Um, but, uh, but pretty much from Charlotte Harbor to the Keys is, is where the vast majority of them are at this point. So at listing, um, any question that you might ask about sawfish, you know, uh, we, we, no one had the answer to it. Um, basically, we just knew that they were born at about two and a half feet um, long, including the saw. Um, they, got, they get to be about 16 feet or so. You know, there's some reports of bigger ones, but reliably, we know they get to be about 16 feet. Um, the juveniles tend to be in um, shallow coastal waters. Adults can be there sometimes, but they're also in deeper water, uh, especially off the Keys. But that's pretty much it. We didn't really know anything else. So um, since we started the, our, our research program, and not just us, but like I say, all the, uh, the collaborators we have, um, the federal researchers, uh, Florida State um, has a research group. Uh, we started answering some questions um, that you would have. So I'm going to touch on a few of these things. Uh, during the presentation and, um, you know, try to fill, you know, like I say, uh, fill in a little, um, some uh, gaps, you know, touch on a few things. And if people want to know more, maybe we can talk more um, afterwards, but I'm um, just trying to um, kind of just give you a, uh, a little bit on everything is, is, is for the time I have. Sometimes people ask me what, you know, how did I, you know, get interested in, in, in doing sawfish research? I mean, it, you know, other than just being a, a weird fish, um, that uh, would be, you know, interesting to study. Um, you know, it was something that uh, this paper came out in 1995 that uh, basically said that there weren't any left. Um, you know, they came to this conclusion, this partial quote here, um, you know, the species can no longer be considered a functional member of the nearshore coastal community. Um, you know, my uh, colleague of mine, Jason Seitz, and I, you know, we read this and just, you know, that's a, a pretty sad statement, you know, that's basically saying there's none left. And, and, and we were, we were a little skeptical and, and optimistic, I guess, at the same time from, uh, because we knew that um, based on the data sources that these uh, researchers used, that they may have missed some, uh, some records. So what we, what we wanted to do was, um, you know, uh, find out if, if what they were saying was true. Uh, we had some information, some, you know, rumors, so to speak, from local bait shops, and we saw pictures, you know, hanging in the, in the bait shops of people with sawfish, and we'd ask questions, and, uh, and we basically developed this poster. Maybe you've seen this at ramps where, um, you know, uh, some version of this we try to maintain at, at uh, ramps around uh, the whole state, but we, you know, obviously around our area for sure where our lab is. And we just ask people to call us, you know, email us. And to our, you know, uh, you, know ha you know, we were <laughs> happy that the phone started ringing uh, and we started getting emails and, and people were seeing them. So it wasn't as dire as, as that uh, uh, research paper had said. So we, Jason and I wanted to kind of, you know, uh, just correct the, the, the literature, you know, just to write the ship, you know, get the, get the information out um, that, uh, that maybe it wasn't quite as bad. So, and we still do this hotline stuff today. I mean, we get four to 500 calls a year um, or, you know, and or emails to our, uh, our hotline uh, even now. So, so what we started just kind of, you know, snowballed and, and it's, it's really been useful. Um, part of the outreach, you know, as we, you know, we knew that people, people were catching them while they were snook fishing or shark fishing. Um, we wanted people to know what to do, you know, keep them in the water. Um, you know, don't bring them on shore, you know, uh, you know, try to untangle them if it's safe to do it, that kind of thing. Um, just some basic information. This is our, our latest sign that we have. Um, you, you may have seen some of these out. We're still in the process of uh, of getting these um, uh, permanent signs, you know, they're 
you know, two and a half by, uh, you know, uh, two and a half feet by 18 inches or so. Um, we try to piggyback them with the manatee, you know, signs and, and um, other informational signs you see at ramps. We'll use a smaller version of this, um, you know, at boat ramps and things too, to try and get some information out. Um, but uh, uh, but uh, just to let people know what, uh, what to do. So um, this is one, one really important thing that came out of the um, interaction uh, between the scientists and the public uh, was this um, juvenile uh, critical habitat designation. So part of being listed on the endangered species list is, um, you know, it, that the, the act itself has, has several things that have to happen. And one of those things is designating critical habitat, uh, if, if at all possible. So, so this was something that was a priority for uh, the small two sawfish recovery team. Um, it's called, I represent the state of Florida on the, uh, the recovery team, which is made up of uh, federal uh, folks, NGOs, uh, different conservation folks, uh, guide, the head of the uh, Florida Guides Association is a member of, of the team. So we are looking at it from a variety of perspectives. And uh, one of the goals of that team uh, was to get this, uh, designate this critical habitat. So you can see that basically the whole Charlotte Harbor estuary is uh, designated uh, and all of this 10,000 Islands Everglades area is, is designated. So, um, so that's obviously a really good thing and it benefits not only sawfish, but um, a lot of the other species that rely on the same, uh, the same habitats. So uh, that's, that's good as well. Um, a typical year, you know, this uh, encounter database, you know, like I say, most of our, our data come from uh, our neck of the woods here in Charlotte Harbor down to the Keys. You know, we get a few up the East Coast, maybe a couple up in Tampa Bay. Uh, and we're hoping to see more and more of those, um, you know, assuming that species continues to uh, slowly recover, um, you know, over the next couple of decades. Um, I probably don't need to say anything about this. I kind of even debated on whether to include this slide, you know, because uh, um, everybody kind of knows this. Um, uh, I would imagine in our neck of the woods, we hear about the, um, the Lake Okeechobee releases and, you know, a, a great deal, obviously. Um, but historically, the, the flow um, down the state uh, called sheet flow ran all the way down the center of the state down into the Everglades, okay? Uh, both coasts, and of course now it's you know, the, that flow comes mostly down the Caloosahatchee. Some of it goes over uh, the St. Lucie River onto the East Coast too. But we get the lion's share of it, right? Which we um, uh, all all know about. So we wanted to uh, focus obviously on on uh, the the uh, Caloosahatchee area here, this boxed area, uh, and also the this Peace River area um, from a juvenile, small juvenile kind of standpoint. Um, to, to get started with our research. So that's where uh, all these dots you see are, are actually points from the encounter database. So people that called us, um, to, they caught a sawfish or they saw one uh, or both, and uh, we start plotting all those on the map and it's pretty easy to see that they, uh, they really gravitate toward these, these areas where big rivers dump into the estuary. So that's where we spend the vast majority of our time for this species. Um, really quick, our research, uh, it, it's part of the fisheries uh, independent monitoring program that, that uh, the state of Florida has, FWC. Um, our funding, even though we work for the state, comes from the federal government um, through Section 6 of the Endangered Species Act, which is um, actually you know, part of the act. It's actually called cooperation with the states because the federal government realizes that a lot of these um, endangered species are going to be in state waters. So there's actually a whole section of the Endangered Species Act that's set aside for that to set up that cooperation, which is um, what's funded us uh, since 2004. So we're, uh, we're hoping to keep that going and uh, for as long as possible. Um, and, um, you know, like I say, we, uh, we're, we, we learned some things, and, and, uh, which we'll talk about tonight, and, and we have um, um, ideas for the next steps and, and what we need to learn um, in the near future, too. Um, our approach, we have basically a two-pronged uh, two approach where we 
um, we'll call uh, use what are called directed sampling, or I call it directed sampling, where uh, somebody will call us on the hotline and say, you know, I'm, I see a, a sawfish at my dock right now, or I caught one, you know, last week or something like that. Um, if we get a couple reports, I may, you know, if I'm on the water, I may go right to the dock. You know, we've done that before. Um, um, but more than likely, it's something where, you know, the next time we go out, we're planning to go on a trip, we'll go there because we, there's a, there's a higher chance of, of seeing one. Uh, and we've actually gotten a lot of tags out by doing that. So uh, that's a big reason why we, we can see with the hotline um, to this day. Uh, we use gill nets um, primarily for the smaller ones. Uh, we set them in shallower water, you know, up to about 10 feet deep. Usually it's shallower than that, you know, uh, four to five feet at the most usually. Um, to catch, uh, when I say small, I'll show you some pictures in a minute, but when I say small, I'm talking like up to five or six feet or so. Um, which, you know, I know that that's a big fish for, for, uh, for some people, but uh, for sawfish, that's, that's what we consider small. Uh, and then we also do random sampling which you know the computer picks the spots right within those boxed areas i showed you uh, and that's you know from a scientific standpoint you know with an eye toward you know being able to uh, in a fair way in a statistical way you know um, look at the trend line is it is it stable is it increasing is it decreasing that kind of thing uh, is why we uh, spent some some of our effort on that also as you can imagine, uh, we want to learn as much as we can about every single fish we get. We catch, um, I would say on average, about 50 fish or so a year. The last couple of years we've been up in the 60s um, and we want, to, we want to learn as much as we can about every one of them. Uh, we'll take a series of measurements, we count the teeth, uh, we'll take about a thumbnail size piece of um, one of the fins, usually the second dorsal. Um, and I'll talk about what we can learn from that in a minute. Um, but every single fish, you know, that's our DNA source, essentially. Um, some of them are entangled in marine debris of some sort, for example, which I'll show you a couple examples of in a minute. You know, we look for parasites, you know, you name it. We want to, you know, give it a once over. We really want to learn as much as we can about those fish. And they're really resilient. So, um, so it works out really well. Um, you know, sometimes we catch fish. You can see here, it's got this one's got a rubber band around its head. Um, basically, any um, cylindrical uh, object uh, they can potentially get entangled by. This doesn't happen terribly often, but we do see it uh, fairly regularly. Uh, um, you know, in the in the uh, Caloosahatchee primarily, I would say, but we've seen it um, in other places in the harbor too. I think what happens is they just, um, they're curious, you know, they see, you know, things on the bottom and they, they end up um, using their saw and they mess around with it and they end up getting it hooked around the end of it and it just kind of works its way, you know, down the saw and ends up getting, and so it can't go any farther because the body starts to widen out. Um, so you can see it's, you know, some fairly um, uh, significant damage can happen um, just from, a, from a, a rubber band. You know, you might not think that. Uh, so it's just gets to, you know, make sure the garbage ends up in the, um, you know, in the garbage can and, and uh, you know, that whole litter, you know, kind of thing that, um, you know, is always, always something that's important to, um, to keep an eye on. Um, hair ties, you know, we've, uh, we've had uh, this a couple times, not often, but this is, you know, similar to a rubber band, um, you know, uh, situations where these, these animals are, uh, um, you know, being damaged by these things, obviously we, we cut those off and, and they heal very well. Uh, even, even, you know, when it looks really bad, we, you know, the ones that we've recaptured have, have healed up really well, which is encouraging. Um, the most recent one that I, I wanted to mention to, the, to you guys is um, we call them ball bungee straps. I'm not sure what the real name is, but we've seen an uptick in these since um, 2018. And one of the, one of the uh, researchers at the lab sleuth this out and um, they're used to hold these boat lift canopies and covers. So, you know, kind of pay attention to this, you know, this plastic ball um, around this, you know, bungee cord. And we see that, you know, I don't know if you can see right here where I'm pointing, um, but here's one around a fish and here's a close up. Um, but if you, um, if you look under a, 
the boat canopies, um, pretty much any of them, there's some version of this where they use it to um, to hold the the fabric to the uh, to the frame uh, on the boat canopy. So um, somehow, you know, sometimes these are ending up in the water, and we're just trying to spread the word to, um, you know, obviously try to prevent you know that from happening at all. But if you drop one in there, you know, scoop it up um, because they uh, they can become a problem uh, with the sawfish. So. Uh, we've talked to the city of Cape Coral uh, about this to, to try to spread the word. Obviously, there's a there's a ton of these in in that area, and we'll uh, we'll be spreading the word even more um, in the in the coming uh, months here uh, about this. But um, remember the uh, the fin clip, that little piece of fin that we take from all the fish. Um, you know, this is a a graph that you don't have to study or anything really. Um, this is just a bunch of different adult females. So when we catch the, the young sawfish, um, we take the fin clips, right? And the DNA um, is, is in the fin clips, right? So there's DNA from mom, there's DNA from dad. Mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited. So it comes only from mom. So we can look at that sequence and look for patterns in the babies that are, that are out in our estuary and to find out, and the, the reason I show you this graph is um, the ones I circled here, um, this particular female, number nine, is an odd year reproducer, and she reproduces every other year. So that was one of the questions that we had in the beginning was, do sawfish uh, reproduce every single year, or is it every other year, or something else? And um, this is a very clear every other year pattern uh, here and, and we don't always catch the young from each one, but um, but it's a you know that was one of the you know puzzle pieces that we were able to put into the giant uh, puzzle of uh, sawfish information uh, just from you know taking that little tiny piece uh, from the fin, which is really cool. And I'll talk about some other things we can learn from that too uh, in a little bit. Um, okay, so. Um, we, uh, as part of our workup, we, we, we tag these things. We use tags that have a number and actually have our hotline number. So if you catch it, you can, you, you have the number right there uh, and you can tell us what number fish it was if you can see it. Um, we use these uh, PIT tags. It's not, it stands for passive integrated transponder. That's uh, the same tag you would use for your dog or your cat. Uh, we, we use, put that in the sawfish and that theoretically stays with it for its whole lifetime. So researchers carry a, there's no battery in it, researchers carry a, uh, excuse me, a scanner so that uh, we can see what number it is. Um, but the acoustic tags are really what I'm going to focus on tonight as far as information because we can learn a, an incredible amount of information, um, you know, just answer a lot of questions with them. So this is a picture of one here. Initially, we just put them on the, the fins on the exterior of the fish and they would last for maybe a year if we got lucky, um, but we were able to start putting them inside the body cavity of the fish uh, in 20, mid-2017. Uh, that's you know, how the, what these tags are, are meant for. So, uh, so we have a lot of, there's a lot of potential there, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but each fish um, will get the, an acoustic tag, it has a, a unique signal. So uh, and then we put uh, receivers out there, acoustic receivers, we call them listening stations all around the harbor and, uh, and, and other researchers use them, the same equipment elsewhere in Florida. I'll show you uh, some maps in a minute and uh, it, it works. It works out really, really well. All right, so let's, let's get into some information, some data, um, not too heavy, but just some, um, some of the research, specific research we've been able to do. So when I say a small juvenile, I'm talking um, up to about five or six feet. So this just gives you an idea of, of what they look like. So this is a, 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 rel, a newborn kind of size, all right? And by their first birthday, uh, they're about five feet, including the saw. So that they grow really, really fast initially um, and kind of continue to grow fast, which is, which is a good thing. Uh, and then large juveniles, actually, you know, it's hard to believe, but you know, uh, six to 10 feet um, is that that's still an immature fish. So this, this big fish here in this picture is still immature, believe it or not. So um, when I say small juveniles, we're talking up to five or six feet, large juveniles, you know, six to 10. All right. So 
um, just talking about some small juveniles for a little bit here most of the time. Um, sawfish have a really cool adaptation um, that, uh, that very few other organisms have. So um, this, this is a, what's called a sheath, a rostral sheath. So um, you might have imagined, you know, with this, um, you know, uh, hedge trimmer for a nose, how does that work? You know, how do the, um, the embryos, how do the brothers and sisters when they're inside mom not hurt each other um, when it's time to get born? You know, how does, how does mom not get hurt, right? So Mother Nature's come up with this really cool way of um, making things work. And uh, there's, there's a covering, you know, the teeth are actually there, but there's a vascularized covering around the, the teeth that goes away in a week or two at the most after these fish are born. So this one's actually starting to lose um, pieces of it. You can see a few of the teeth sticking out um, down here, maybe one right here, um, but uh, very, very cool adaptation um, for uh, during, you know, during that embryonic stage. Um, so we've done acoustic tagging, you know, in, in these areas that we kind of concentrate on this upper Harbor area and, you know, the Peace River, it's natural flow. Um, and we've been able to identify one, we call it a nursery hotspot. So um, this boxed area here that I kind of zoomed in on, this is uh, around the US 41, you know, between the US 41 and I-75 bridges uh, in the river. That's, that's where they like to be. Um, and that's from our catch data and the acoustic data uh, and the hotline data, really. So there's multiple lines of evidence of this. And the young, the, the baby ones are born, typically April, May is kind of the peak. Um, they can be a little bit on either side of that, but April and May is at the peak of when, uh, when they're born in, in this area. Um, Clusahatchee River, okay, so down uh, near uh, the Sanibel, uh, just behind Sanibel here, right? Um, you know, we, we uh, again, put these acoustic tags out. As we all know, the flow regime is, is anything but natural, right, in the Clusahatchee. So it makes for a good comparison to the Peace River. Uh, in the Clusahatchee, we found multiple nursery hotspots. So there's areas, at least four areas, they're coupled on either side of the mouth here, um, you know, more kind of mid-river uh, around the, um, you know, Pepper Tree Point area, and then up around the US 41 bridges. Those are areas that they tend to be in uh, fairly regularly over many years. Um, so that's why we call them uh, nursery hotspots. <clears throat> uh, and again, uh, April and May is when the young are being born in the Clusahatchee as well. So um, from uh, the encounter data and the acoustic data, we've noticed that um, during wet years or during the wet time of the year, summertime, um, the sawfish tend to be in the, the lower part of the river, near the mouth, okay? Um, the, uh, dur and then during the dry times of the year, okay? So here's a couple of examples. They get up in the canals, no problem. We, you know, they get back up in there. We do see, a, see that. Um, but during the dry years or during the dry season, you know, if we don't get a lot of rain, usually, um, you know, March, April, May is, is uh, very dry. The salinity goes up in the river. We see them all the way up, you know, almost, we've had them all the way up to the lock. Uh, typically, they don't go quite that far, but um, certainly up past the US 41 bridges during the dry times. Um, again, so the acoustic data has really um, strengthened this, uh, this kind of pattern that we see. All right, so let's get into some you know, different um, movements and even into some behavior kinds of stuff. So the way this, this acoustic um, situation works, these we call them listening stations, right? Um, it listens in all directions, okay, 24 hours a day. Anytime a tagged fish swims by there, uh, it, it, re it registers with the code and the time. So we know what's going on. Um, and over long periods of time, okay? Um, this is, uh, the technology is always improving and it's, it's really amazing and perfect for, for what the questions that we're trying to answer on sawfish and other local fishes too, uh, and other species as well, but um, uh, not, not just fish. Um, but, uh, but there's a lot of people using the same information, uh, the same uh, technology, the same equipment so um, people that people that record our sawfish 
um, on their machines and we share the data, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. So again, um, initially we used external attachments, but we lately we've kind of moved more into the internal. So we're, um, we don't have to worry about tag retention anymore, which is, uh, which is a good thing for, for kind of where we're headed. Uh, speaking of the other researchers, there's all kinds of data sharing networks now, uh, all the way up the east coast of Florida, uh, all the way up into the you know the east the whole east coast of the U.S. There's um, networks that uh, you know if your fish happen to go there, um, they'll you know somebody will call you uh, sooner or later, which is really really neat. ITAG is the uh, the group that operates in the Gulf of Mexico, um, and that's you know large scale, so you're covered on you know, a really large scale, um, you know, if, if you're, you know, your species or life history stage, you know, adults tend to move the more than juveniles, but, um, but I'm going to focus more mostly on what I call medium scale movements today for, for time, you know, reasons mainly, but this is a, a relatively recent um, map of where the, the listening stations are in our general area. So, We've got all the ones that we maintain. We maintain a little over 100 of them uh, throughout the Caloosahatchee River and the Peace River, Upper Harbor. And then there's other researchers, all these different other colored uh, um, triangles are other researchers that uh, are using the same equipment. Uh, so we've gotten um, uh, you know, detections from there too, um, which I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about here in a minute. So, Obviously, with this flow situation that we find ourselves in in the Caloosahatchee, uh, we wanted to make sure that we uh, we covered our bases locally here. Um, and uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, I just you know want to mention that the data that we collect and you know these hotspots that we've identified and things, um, these data get used by uh, the federal government. Um, you know, NOAA is. Uh, um, the, the parent organization, right, of the National Marine Fisheries Service. So um, at the recovery team meetings, you know, we're constantly presenting new information. So it's available. We eventually publish the information, but it's being used uh, for to help, you know, make management decisions in uh, almost a real time kind of a way, which is which is good, obviously. Same thing in the Peace River. Um, the data um, have been used uh, to, uh, you know, for uh, by managers. Um, they 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 know that this this area is really important for sawfish, um, you know, based not largely on this the acoustic data that we have and um, some of the projects that uh, that I'm talking about tonight. So that's you know, I just wanted to mention that it it is being used in um uh, by by managers. Um, the Nature Conservancy approached us. So, um, you know, once we kind of had this medium scale understanding of where the, the juveniles were, um, we wanted to, you know, that we had to ask some other questions, right? The next question was, um, one of them is, is here uh, based on an oyster restoration project. So um, this, this red area, this portion of the Peace River here was an area that the Nature Conservancy and their partners were interested in doing some um, oyster restoration, putting in some um, reefs and things. Uh, and they wanted to know, are, are there sawfish in that area um, beforehand? Are there sawfish using those reefs uh, after the fact? So uh, so we put, we kind of catered uh, that area with, or covered that area and catered it toward, toward that question with uh, this technology I'm talking about. So um, what we were able to see from our, our regular listening stations was that they tended to be in this hot spot in yellow, and I kind of circle, and hopefully you can see that. This is the area uh, on this graph here. The, the gray is nighttime and uh, white is daytime. So they were moving um, from this area, they were in this um, hot spot area during the day, and then kind of moving toward this, this area at night where the restoration was. But we weren't sure if they were actually crossing the river or not. You know, we knew that, um, you know, this is just another way of looking at it, this kind of heat map where, you know, warmer colors mean, you know, they spent more time there. Um, so most of their time was being spent in that, you know, that hot spot that we knew about, um, especially during the daytime, you know, almost all the detections are within this box. But at night, you can kind of see that they were, they were starting to, it looked like they were, you know, maybe crossing the river, but we weren't 
we weren't sure we couldn't tell you know um so here's daytime there's night you know you can see that and you know but we you know so we couldn't answer that question um specifically so what we did was we we put some listening stations close enough together um that we could time sync them and um measure that you know there's a an algorithm that the that the uh, company uses um that analyzes the time that the signal is received at each listening station so you're basically triangulating where the fish was and estimating it uh, on, a, on a relatively small scale so within a couple of meters within five or six feet um is is what they they think the accuracy is so we put one of these, uh, they call it a, a Vemco positioning system um, up in that area where they were doing the oyster restoration along the shoreline. So these triangles are those stations. And the answer is yes, they were crossing the river. They were coming all the way over and getting along the, this red mangrove shoreline, which you know that's a habitat that they like. Um, and uh, we were able to, to plot these um, movements which, uh, which was really cool up onto the flat, um, which is really, uh, uh, really kind of cool. Like I say, the technology is always changing and, and uh, it's really amazing um, to, to be able to, to do, these, uh, do these things. So, because well, you know, years ago, you'd have to get in a kayak and you'd have to, you know, get all your friends and, you know, you'd have to go out for as long as you can, you know, four or five, six hours, then you'd have to have somebody else follow the fish around. And, you know, basically we're getting that, um, manual data 24 hours a day, which is, which is pretty amazing. Um, so what we ended up doing was revising this hotspot boundary. We made it from this yellow into this red area here, uh, made it a little bit bigger. And, um, you know, it's important to, I, from a manager standpoint, you know, to kind of identify these really important areas. It's all critical habitat. Um, you know, it's all important, you know, that whole estuary is important, but some of these areas it's, it's, it's turned out um, are really the, the, the species is really focused in on, which is, uh, which is something that uh, is obviously important to know and helps the managers make decisions when projects come up and uh, things like that. So the next question, right, is um, what are the sawfish um, doing there? You know, they like it there, you know, clearly, um, what are what are their behaviors? You know, what's what are they actually doing? So there's a, a technology called an acceleration data logger, um, sometimes sometimes called an accelerometer, um, that can get at that um, that that specific question. Uh, Nick Whitney, uh, who was working at Moat for a time, he's not there anymore, but a uh, really interesting uh, researcher. He's got a, a really cool TED talk. Um, you know, just Google uh, Nick Whitney TED Talk, and he'll he'll explain this in much more detail than me, um, much better than me too, I'm sure. But he's a really funny guy, and and I knew that he was using this technology on uh, sharks, and he even used it on pythons, and it's really cool. But it's literally the um, the the mechanism that makes your iPhone uh, the the screen switch when you move your your iPhone if you have one. Um, so some smart people figured out how to record those um, those switching, so to speak, and uh, it's just a way of of connecting uh, these acoustic studies to behavior and even physiology. So uh, for us, feeding was a big question. You know, it's it's unlikely to be a, a predation thing. There's really nothing um, in the in, you know other than maybe bull sharks. There's really nothing in the estuary that's going to mess with these sawfish. Uh, on any big scale. Um, so feeding is kind of our hypothesis of why they would be moving around the river. Uh, but you can also answer questions such as, you know, where are they most active? When are they most active? Um, you know, how often do they rest? Uh, if you can identify a feeding signal, when does that happen? You know, so it's really a cool opportunity. And I was lucky that, that Nick was uh, interested in, in checking this out too. So this is just an example of what we got from one of the fish. Um, you, you put the accelerometer tag on the fish and it stays on for about five days. And then you have to recover the tag. Um, and we did that on 10 fish and we recovered eight of them, which I thought was good. Uh, but you can see for this one, especially there was more activity at night. These gray lines are night 
Um, and then daytime, they were still active, but not as much. Uh, but this was very clear, at least during this five day period uh, for this, this little fish um, that, we, that, we, uh, that we were able to tag. Um, but one of the things, you know, I, I figured with sawfish, it would be a really cool signal because they, they swipe that saw back and forth really, really fast, usually four or five times really fast. And I kind of guessed that the, the signal from the accelerometer tag would, would look like, a, like an earth, like a seismograph from an earthquake. You know, everybody's seen that, you know, that, that, that pen that jumps right during an, uh, during an earthquake. But, and, that's, and that's exactly the, the kind of signal that we see. So here's one where this is just normal tailbeat mo motion. And then you see this, you know, kind of earthquake activity on several different axes. And this, you know, continues for um, about two minutes and they change depths during that time. And then they kind of go back to that, you know, similar uh, uh, tailbeat uh, situation. So, so very cool. And, and uh, like I say, we, we don't know for sure that they were feeding during this. Ideally, you would do some tank work and things and they have on other species of sawfish. Um, so we're reasonably sure that that's uh, what we're seeing here in, in, uh, with this uh, particular tag, which is kind of cool. All right, so um, I want to get to some of this uh, um, large juvenile stuff and then maybe a little diet stuff is all I'm going to have time for. But um, switch gears now to the large juvenile stuff. So like six to 10 foot uh, sawfish we're talking about now. Um, we were able to do some internal tags. We started those mid-2017 and we've been you know, putting those out for um, the last couple of years. And we're up to 124 of those. And those are about five year, four to five year tags or 10 year tags, believe it or not. Um, it's a very you know, relatively small tag um, that, that we can program to last 10 years. So we're gonna get information in, uh, for a whole decade on, on these fish, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, this happens to be the one I, I mentioned it earlier. This is the one um, that was about one year old. It's about a five footer that we were able to get a 10 year tag in over in the St. on the St. Lucie side, um, over on the East coast where, uh, where the, the other portion of the water that gets released, released out of the lake, uh, ends up. So we're really, uh, interested in seeing the data, um, come, come back on this fish. Um, so, uh, stay tuned for that, I guess, uh, next time. Um, but we're really excited about that. So, um, locally here, these, this is two areas where, um, where we wanted to um, kind of, uh, we, we had gotten some reports through the hotline. We've linked up with a couple of guides. Uh, Captain uh, John Conway is a, is, is a local guide that fishes um, this Caloosahatchee area that's been super helpful to us. Um, and we've, we've tagged, you know, a fair number of these um, kind of medium-sized fish, these six to 10 footers. Um, and just to give you an idea, we're seeing kind of a similar day-night um, uh, pattern of movement where this is a little hard to see. I know this is Pine Island um, here on the left side of these maps. Uh, this is Shell Point here, just Sword Point over here. So this is the mouth of the, of the Caloosahatchee. So we caught um, these in this, this particular map is five juveniles, uh, and they stayed pretty much where we caught them um, for months, a couple of months um, during the day. But at night, they were moving over more toward Pine Island and up into Mount Lachey Pass. Uh, and then, you know, obviously they were still in that, in that uh, mouth of the Clusa, mouth of the, yeah, mouth of the river area too. So, um, so we're just starting to learn about what's happening within the harbor um, with this bigger size class of fish um, that are still immature, you know. So one of the questions was, how long do they stay in the harbor? You know, do those juveniles leave or do they stay until they get mature that kind of thing so um what, this is a uh, really new information here um we tagged fish here's uh you know the clusahatchee um 11 of those large juveniles that we tagged have been detected down here in the lower keys which uh is really cool so they're definitely juveniles still and they're leaving our area and and going down to the lower keys um, and one of the things we noticed um, so far is that they're not being detected along the shoreline. You know, one of our questions is, are they hugging the shoreline when they go down south or are they just kind of beelining it straight down, uh, you know, toward, uh, toward the lower keys? 
Um, so, and there's a lot of receivers over here in this area, and we only we only get data from um, other researchers if they get detected. So um, this whole area here is kind of a blind spot over here in Florida Bay and um, most of the Everglades. So it's kind of interesting. We'll see if that holds up over the next couple of years, but, um, but really, really cool. And we've had half a dozen so far of those fish have actually made it all the way back, back to Charlotte Harbor. Um, so we'll keep an eye on that and see, uh, especially with the females, because we know that once they mature, they come back every other year, right? So, um, so we got a lot of, a lot of cool things to, to uncover in the next couple of years, which, uh, which we're excited about. One of the things, you know, on the, in the real near future here, I'm going to, you know, work at, um, is to try to get receivers, those listening stations out on those old radio towers. So any of, you know, if you've been out and anybody goes offshore, uh, the Air Force used to maintain these radio towers and um, uh, they, don't, they, not, they don't maintain them anymore, uh, but they're really, they're kind of like artificial reefs. A lot of people spearfish out there, um, you know, hook and line fish. Um, there is a receiver, at least last time I heard on this, the, the P tower it's called, um, but I'd like to get receivers on these other ones to to just see, if, you know, so we can confirm that they're kind of beelining it straight south. You know, I feel like maybe they might cruise by one of these uh, receive these uh, these old towers. So, so we'll see if you, you know if you happen to swim out there, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, swim by swim. I mean, you know, spearfish or or hook and line fish. Um, I'm you know maybe looking to to get some uh, volunteers to kind of help swap out receivers, and um, it's really not a a hard thing to do, but I think we could learn a lot, not just about sawfish, but we could learn about tarpon and cobia and, and all kinds of stuff. So I'm kind of excited to try to um, make that happen. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm running a little short on time, but I wanted to touch a little bit on the diet um, stuff. Everybody wants to know what they eat, you know, including us. Um, there was very little information in the literature. Um, as as I, you know, I said before, we, we really didn't know um, anything about these things. However, every now and then we'll catch sawfish and they'll have fish scales impaled on those rostral teeth. So that gives you a clue as to, you know, they're probably eating fish at least part of the time. Uh, sometimes you can identify which fish they are based on the scales, which is kind of neat. Um, sometimes uh, we'll, we'll get an, a, a dead sawfish, you know, one will die and we'll get the carcass and be able to look in the stomach and we've been able to learn a little bit um, that way. Um, but one of the cool things is, to, you know, getting back to that fin clip that uh, I mentioned earlier, we can take a tiny piece of that and use some um, cool chemistry, you know, just stable isotopes, um, it's called, you know, you can look at different elements and um, get some clues as to what kinds of food that they're assimilating. Uh, it's, a, it's a little different than looking in the stomach, but it's, uh, you know, not a snapshot like, uh, like a stomach content analysis would be, it's more, you know, what have they assimilated into their body, you know, so what, maybe what, what do they eat fairly often? So we uh, collaborated with a, a, a PhD student actually a few years ago. And um, because we um, didn't know much about um, what sawfish ate, uh, but we had fin clips from bull sharks and cow nose rays, which we also catch during our sampling, I uh, put some, you know, some Christmas colors here for you guys. Um, all you have to do is pay attention to where the colors are. So um, the bull sharks are in green, the sawfish are in red, and you can see that they're they're pretty much eating the same kinds of things. Um, the, the black here is the cow nose rays. So we knew what the bull sharks ate, we knew what the cow nose rays ate, and we inferred what the sawfish ate based on um, that comparison. So the indication is from these data is that sawfish are fish eaters in general, okay? Um, so the next question, right, is you're thinking, well, what fish, right? So what we wanted to do was, um, it's a little weird, okay? Scientists sometimes are weird. We, uh, we do weird things, uh, uh, and, um, but sometimes when we catch sawfish, um, they will defecate. Um, so we saved it because we knew that there's DNA in, in uh, that uh, fecal matter. So we could compare that to known sequences and figure out some of the species that, uh, that they're eating. So 
Um, this was a collaboration between uh, our lab and some researchers at uh, FGCU. And we used a, a really sensitive genetics technique um, to analyze uh, 15 of these uh, samples that we were able to get. And we were able to show um, that sawfish ate, those sawfish ate uh, at least 19 different species of bony fishes. Uh, here's a picture of a few, uh, a few of them here. Uh, and also with stingrays, there's at least one species of stingray in there as well. And we've caught sawfish that have had the tail of, um, or actually I wasn't on the trip, but um, the, the crew caught a sawfish once that had two stingray tails uh, sticking out of the mouth. So we know they do eat stingrays from time to time too. Um, so really cool uh, technology is always evolving and we, you know, we're trying to apply that as much as we can um, to these questions that we have um, about this species. So um, I'm just finishing up here, um, you know, the, um, you know, I kind of think of this whole uh, project as a, as a giant puzzle. And, you know, you know, we try to put, you know, a few of the puzzle pieces together um, every now and then. And, and um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of fun to do these talks and, because we, you know, we can talk about some of these puzzle pieces. So, um, you know, some of these things we, we've already learned and there's other pieces that, uh, that we're still working on. And like I say, we're, we're really looking forward to that information from those um, uh, ten-year acoustic tags uh, that are uh, they're going to be swimming around for uh, for for that long. It's hard to believe, um, but uh, we're going to learn a lot in the next couple of years. So, um, so that's that's it um, for my time. Um, here's another a longer list of uh, folks that have helped with this research um, along the way. Uh, like I say, it's, it's certainly not me doing it all. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot to be done. And, and uh, thankfully, there's a lot of people that are interested in, um, in, in working on uh, the species. So um, I think, uh, thank all these folks. Um, and uh, we can answer some questions if, uh, if people have them and sure. uh, go from there. Well, thanks so much, Greg. We do have some questions. That was really great. And I think, uh, I think we got, um, some some particularly good questions. If you would stop uh, sharing your screen and we'll be able to see you as you answer these. Um, one that we got several versions of effectively is how much of their life cycle are they living in fresh water? And I'd like to add to that, just seeing the map of a region I'm very familiar with, why why is it that you that they aren't using the Mayaka River the way they use the Peace River according to your your dots? Yeah, so you know it, it may be a little misleading um, there. I mean, we do we they do use the mouth of the of the Mayaka um, somewhat. We do get reports. Uh, I think you, you're you're probably familiar, Ryan, with the um, the El Jobin Pier there. You know, a lot, there's a you know a fair number of fishermen there. Um, um, you know, uh, regularly, and we do get you know we do get some reports there, um, but not as many as the Peace River. And I think the reason for that is because it just just simply the volume of freshwater coming down, um, you know, the, the Peace River and the Clusahatchee are just uh, bigger sources of freshwater. So I think they're just queuing in on that um, a little bit more and have for, you know, eons. So um, because the females are coming back uh, to the same um, river to give birth, you know, a lot like salmon and, you know, the turtles coming back to the same beaches, um, you know, that, that plays a role in that too. But, you know, we do, we do see them over there. So it's not um, that they're not using the Mayaka at all. Mm -hmm. And so what, how much of their life cycle are they spending in freshwater? Um, in straight freshwater, I mean, unless, um, I mean, the Clusahatchee is a little different because of the, you know, the releases and stuff. Um, but they're really not reliant on, on fresh water at all. They can handle it. Um, you know, they live in straight fresh water during the, you know, the end of summer, you know, they're, we've caught them in, you know, uh, zero parts per thousand. I mean, it's totally fresh. They can handle it when they're little. I don't think the big ones are, you know, like that at all. You, you know, that's not unique to sawfish. A lot of species are able to with, withstand the, the salinity changes when they're, um, when they're young, but they kind of lose that uh, when they get older. And I think, I think sawfish, you know, fall into that category, but, um, but uh, I think, does that, does that answer the question? Okay. Yeah, that, no, sure. I think so. Yeah. 
And folks are asking about the population size and, and the trends. I mean, is there some hope? You know, we're, we're a partner, SCCF's a partner in, in Mission Blue's Hope Spot in the Gulf Coast. And so we're always looking for, for hopeful stories in the ocean. So what's the outlook? Yeah, so you know the the population has been it's it's been stable. I think the you know the the protections that we we talked about in the beginning, you know, the state of Florida protected the species in 1992, um, and then you know the Everglades actually it wasn't you know the Everglades wasn't uh, designated for sawfish, but because sawfish use the Everglades, they benefited from Everglades National Park, which was formed in what 1940. Five, I want to say something like that. Um, so that 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 helped. Um, so I think um, at least in in you know from Charlotte Harbor you know down into the Everglades, the population um, has been stable um, for for a while. But uh, we're just getting to the point now where we have enough um, what we call fisheries independent data um, to you know from our research basically to start looking at those trends. And, and it's actually a, a, a slow increase right now. So that, that's, that's, a, that's a good sign. I mean, it's, it's a, we're, we're uh, cautiously optimistic um, that that's, uh, that that's uh, gonna continue and, and, and that's, uh, that's good news for sure. Yeah, no, that is great news. So this is, this is an interesting question and there's, it's kind of, it was almost asked in, in two ways. So, we heard in the news today, and SCCF has been vocal on this, about the Environmental Protection Agency turning over wetland permitting to the state of Florida. Um, and the question is largely, what role um, does sawfish habitat play in, in development decisions? But specifically, at you as our state's expert in, in sawfish, will you have a role in the state's new process on mangrove permitting um, as it affects uh, sawfish, and it might be too early to know that, but <laughs> yeah. So um, the the short answer is that you know basically, you know we we are are doing our research and analyzing the data, and we provide those data. Um, in, you know, in, like I say, we're, we interact with the National Marine Fishery Service uh, regularly. Um, so they, they know what's going on um, with, uh, with what we're doing at any given time. Um, and those data, you know, those data are available, you know, to state folks as well. Uh, from what I'm hearing as far as the, that, that new, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of, you know, uh, I don't know what you call it, just the, the different, um, you know, the, the how the things process, are being designated yeah. and who's designating it and stuff. Um, it, it looks like, I mean, sawfish aren't, <clears throat> they're not getting up into those, um, those salt marsh areas. I mean, they depend on, on, on that healthy habitat for sure. Um, and, you know, if you remember from the uh, early in the talk that that critical habitat map mm -hmm. um, includes um, those, those areas. So, so I think from a, um, you know, a long term. From what I've heard, it's it's going to be fine. You know, sawfish wise. I mean, I think we're uh, the the protections that are there for sawfish are good. They're in the right place. And from what I'm hearing, as far as the um, the new designations, I think we'll, we're going to be all right in that regard. But like I say, we'll we'll see. I'm not directly involved in that, um, but uh, but obviously the the manage the management folks are and. You know, if they have any questions, they'll uh, they'll circle back with us. But uh, what I'm hearing is 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 it sounds good to me. Um, okay. If if that makes sense. No, yeah, sure. Yeah. No. And from a soft from the sawfish point of view, that's great. Um, do you? Uh, one question came in about different kinds of protections. How do our state protections differ from our federal protections for sawfish? So, um, basically, the state um, protected them from harvest. In 1992, so you can't keep one. You haven't been able to keep one legally since 1992. Um, and our law enforcement, you know, folks work with the the federal folks. Um, you know, the the protections are there's several layers there now. You know, they were always protected in the state, which kind of gets back to the the stable and you know getting them on the road to recovery question earlier is that. Um, they, they, they complete their life cycle in state waters. So the fact that they've been protected in the state for a little over a decade longer, they've been protected on the Endangered Species Act, which is a federal designation, 
um, you know, it just, they work together. The thing that the, the federal protection really helped with is, is funding. Um, because as soon as that Endangered Species Act gets involved, um, there's a whole series of things that are supposed to happen. And theoretically, the federal government is supposed to fund. Um, and, you know, the funding hasn't been anywhere near where it should be, but it's enough where we've been able to, you know, kind of not just us, but, you know, all the researchers that work on the species have been able to chip away at some of these questions. So, um, so I think we're overall, we're in a good spot. And I can tell you, everybody that the, the law enforcement guys work together and, um, you know, on cases and, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, that, that's a good situation. That's great. Yeah. So I think um, one thing I want to drive home because we do have so many anglers, most of them are responsible, but I do, I do, I would love if you would just go over again, what are the best practices? Because we're trying to teach people about how fragile shark species are in general. We have this idea of them as these tough creatures, but in fact, many of them die in recreational fisheries. So what's the best, how do we, how do we handle, if you catch a small tooth sawfish, how do you put it back to increase its likelihood of likelihood of living? Yeah, the, the biggest thing is to keep it in the water. Um, a, it seems obvious maybe to a lot of people, but, um, you know, it's such a weird catch that a lot of times people want to, you know, depending on where they are, obviously, they want to drag it up onto the beach to take pictures or whatever. Um, and, and that's just, that's something that, you know, we understand you want to take a picture, um, but, but keep it in the water. That's, that's the number one thing. Um, a lot of times they, you know, sharks do this too, where they, they get caught and they'll start to spin. And when, because they have that long saw, a lot of times they get, they get wrapped up in, in your line or, and, or your leader. Um, and so what, what we like to do is, you know, keep the fish, uh, what we recommend is that keep the fish in the water, try to untangle that, uh, that, that, you know, any, any of that tangled, you know, mess that happens sometimes if it's safe, obviously, uh, and then just cut it as close to the hook as possible uh, and let the fish go. So somewhere in there, hopefully somebody could take a picture or whatever, um, you know, uh, you know, safely. Um, but, uh, but in a nutshell, that's, that's what we recommend. Try to, you know, keep it in the water, untangle it, cut it loose as soon as possible. Great. And then I think we got time for one quick one that I think is, is fun and people would like the answer. What, do sawfish have poor eyesight um, or because they're, they seem to be in murky water so often? How, do, how does that work? Well, I mean, I, I would, I mean, there's, there's been very little research done on their eyesight. Um, they have a really cool, um, I don't know if I had a close up enough picture anywhere in my talk, but they have a really cool eyelid kind of a, a thing. It's called a, a, a papillary. That, that covers, I don't know if you've seen that before, Ryan, but it's like a, it looks like a triangle that comes down and it can cover up that, um, that pupil. Uh, and we see that during the daytime, but they can retract it up during the nighttime. Um, but, uh, but they, you know, they, I think their eyesight is actually pretty good. Um, you know, just from what I've seen, I mean, and, and of course, during different times of the year, the visibility isn't going to be so great, but that's where those other senses come in. Right. That's where they can uh, use their uh, sense of smell. That's where they, you know, that's, that's something that they can pick up on uh, stimuli from really far away. And then as they get closer to what, you know, what they smelled and wanted to investigate, that's when that electric sense can, can kick in. So, um, you know, just, and that's not unique to sawfish. A lot of the sharks and rays have this kind of, um, you know, series of uh, really cool senses that work in concert. So, um, their eyesight's there and it's good if, if it's clear enough, but they got lots of backup plans. So mm -hmm. it's, right. it's, uh, it's a, a cool, cool group of fish. And I don't, I don't think I need to convince sure. you of that, Ryan. You already, you already not get not it. Me. <laughs> Do they have ampullae of Lorenzini like shark? Do they? Absolutely. Yeah. They, they have them all yeah. the way out onto the rostrum. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Well, everyone, uh, Greg, I want to thank you. That was really great. I mean, this is, I, I think you really you drove home just how lucky we are to have these creatures and how honestly what a tremendous responsibility is for us to be good stewards of these creatures as unfortunately we're becoming one of the last spots on the entire planet to protect sawfish and so it really I think more than ever um, the pressure is such that if we want sawfish to last globally Australia and Florida certainly better do a good job because we have the means to do so.
So thank you so much, Greg. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And, uh, and, and please give Greg a call if you, if you see us offish. Call the number. We'll post it on our website. Thanks so much. Have a good night. See ya. Thank you.